it, it'll, it'll be okay. It's, um, Well, good morning and welcome to worship today. We are glad that you are here. You are our ray of sunshine on this cloudy day. So I um, want to make a few announcements. I hope you picked up a weekly window. It has important information. You might think these two announcements um, about celebration or music are the same. They are not. So look at the details. Um, the next three Sundays at 3 o'clock, we have a concert here. Today it's brass, and next week it's Sally Zudi who will be singing for us. And uh, so take note of those. And then also on April 7th, we have uh, Jim Hinton and a group who will be singing as well. So um, we hope that you can participate in those. Invite your neighbors and friends to come as well. Um, it's time to order Easter lilies and tulips and hyacinths. Um, fill out that form. We love to fill our sanctuary with the beautiful smells of fresh spring flowers for our Easter celebration. So if you can order one, that would be great. Um, Tom Powell has an announcement. Tom, if you want to come to a mic there. Come to the mic in front if you can. Good morning. Um, this is from the search committee. Uh, just to let you know that we are meeting. We'll be meeting again this next Monday. Uh, we've met a number of times. We are in the process of putting together who we are as a church. And when you consider how diversified we are as a church, uh, to get something for a future minister, it's a kind of a challenge. Uh, we are also putting together a survey. Uh, we had thought about an electronic survey, but we have thought about that and we think we want to send something home with you or mail it so that you have time to think about uh, answers and not just have one per family, but we would like to know what everybody in the family is thinking. Uh, so this is what we are working on. Uh, we have a goal of, um, in April, to get our who we are together. And uh, we would like to start by June 1st, uh, putting something out to the public as to what we are looking for. Please, if you have any questions, any comments, any suggestions for us, talk to the members of the search committee. We want to hear from you. Uh, we want as many differing opinions as we can possibly get. Thank you. And if you're looking for the names of the members of the search committee, you'll notice that they're listed on one of the metal doors as you come into the, to the hallway there from, from the vestibule. They're all listed there. Pick any one of them and feel free to talk to them. Lori has an announcement about one great hour of sharing. Good morning. The, over the last couple of weeks, you've been hearing about One Great Hour of Sharing and the things it does for disaster relief and work with refugees. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about what you are doing for social and econ economic development around the world. Did you know that you are educating children and adults around the world? You are working on women's empowerment you are also helping to get an end to tuberculosis and create healthy communities. Did you know that you are also working on economic development by creating clean water for all, uh, sustainable agriculture, and other things to help in developing countries? So next week, we are taking our One Great Hour of Sharing offering, and I hope that you will prayerfully think about what you can do to continue your work. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next week is the offering for the adults. I want the kids to know that your offering, and there's banks back there if you didn't get one, comes in on Palm Sunday, so you have more time to fill your bank. But adults, um, next Sunday for you, and there are banks in the back if you'd like to pick one up as well. So let us begin our worship together with our call to worship. God made us. God, made each other. God loves us. God loves That's our true self. self. God, God blesses us. us with healing and hope. Let us turn to God. <laughs> our prayer of confession. God of all mercy, we confess before you and each other that we have been unfaithful to you. We lack love for our neighbors. We waste opportunities to do good, and we look the other way when you cry out to us in suffering of our brothers and sisters in need. We are sincerely sorry for our sins both those we commit and those that we allow to overtake us. We ask your forgiveness and pray for strength that we may follow in your way and love all your people with that perfect love which casts out all fear 
through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. these words of assurance. Jesus lived in love with all whom he met, letting nothing separate him from authentic relationships with others. Jesus accepted death at the hands of those he loved and was resurrected from the dead in witness to God's redeeming and all-powerful love. In Jesus, we know that God loves us, that we are forgiven of our sins. Let us celebrate God's love. Let's greet one another with the peace of Christ. I'd like the children to head on down here. Come on down. Layla, hi. Hi, Violet. Hi, Ricky. Hi, girls. Come on down. Wow, big sister's carrying little sister. Yay, good. So, hi, <laughs> you are just too cute. I like your water spouts. <laughs> What's it mean to be healthy? What's it mean to be healthy? Does it mean to smile and to be happy? Yeah, she says, yeah. What else does it mean to be healthy? Well, we usually say we're healthy if we're not sick. Yeah. But if somebody says, oh, I'm going to get healthy, what, what are they going to do? Yeah, eat more vegetables, uh-huh. <laughs> Maybe those Brussels sprouts, uh-huh. Um, what else might they do to get healthy? Drink water. Mm -hmm. There's another, there's that E word that they do. Yeah, exercise, yeah. You know, God created each one of us, and we're pretty amazing. And God created us to be healthy, for our bodies to work together. Isn't it amazing when you think about it that you know, when you drink water and you take good care of your body, that your heart just knows how to work and it knows how to beat and keep beating and that your blood goes through you. Isn't that amazing to think about? It is. And, you know, look at your, look at your hands. Isn't it, isn't it exciting to see all that your hands can do and all the ways they can move? Do you know, notice your elbow. What would happen if your elbow didn't bend this way? 
but bent the other way. That would be weird, wouldn't it? And, and you know what? Very sad thing would be, it'd be really hard to eat because you could, if your elbows only bent the other way, you'd be really skinny because you couldn't get the food in your mouth. You'd have to um, eat maybe like a dog. So, you know, we are, we are really amazing creatures. And God tells us to take good care of the animals around us and the things that God created, but to take care of ourselves as well. So I want you to think about what's, what is one thing you can do this week, and I know many of you have spring break, to take care of yourself. What's one thing maybe you can say, I'm going to do this week to take care of myself? You're going to drink more water. You're going to go run. Mm. What are you going to do? You're going to run after your sister? <laughs> you're going to, you're going to what? You're going to chase your little sister? Uh-huh. Good idea. Ricky, what do you think you can do? What do you want to do to be more healthy this week? To do one healthy thing. Help your grandma helping to clean. That's a great thing to do. What are you going to do? Eat less junk food. Boy, I need to be on your plan. Uh huh. Yes. You know, um, I gave up for Lent. I gave up carbs and I gave up sugar. So, you know what? That really eliminates the junk food. <laughs> and so I need Lent to last all year long um, and, and to stay away from that. We all need those um, opportunities to say, you know what, I'm going to try this just for now. So let's thank God for our wonderful bodies and make a commitment to do one thing this week that's healthy. And all of you can make that same commitment. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for creating us and, and for making our bodies be these wonderful machines that work perfectly together. Thank you for all the blessings of life and help us to appreciate them. We pray in Jesus' name and everybody say amen. 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 Okay, you are off to Sunday school.
Good morning. It's always an honor when I'm asked to read, but it's an even bigger honor to have Pew 4 so full with my parents. They're here to worship and hear me read. So here we go. Our first reading today is Genesis 1, verses 26 to 31. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image and in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given you green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Our second reading today is Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all that you are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take these words with you this week. It's God's word. Will you join with me? Well, God, send your spirit to be with us, that we may discern your love, discern your truth, discern your ways in our study of these, this your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. When our beer burgers in the Bible group met this past Monday, we talked about what health was about And sooner or later, the conversation got steered into, well, I got a new shoulder, or I'm going to have an ankle transplant, or a hip transplant, or a knee transplant. And it went on and on and on, and I was reminded of a saying from Gwen Dragu back in Tilden, Nebraska, who told me once, well, I'm in good health so long as I can get parts. (laughs) But good health is not always so easy. Bob Roberts was a retired dentist who started working as a hobby with ex-offenders, people who got out of prison. And he found himself working in Louisiana with the most violent ex-offenders, people who had the highest rates of returning to prison because they couldn't stop participating in violent crime. And as part of the program, and he he got a grant to do this, He had job training that meant something. They did all kinds of programs. They had addiction training. And they had a group building exercise where small groups of inmates would sit down together. And he would have them introduce themselves and then tell us the first time you experienced violence. And they sit around. Yeah. But sooner or later, someone starts, and they say, well, I remember when my dad yelled at my mother. Or then someone else decides, I can do better than that. And they start playing what's called topper. You've got a story, I've got a story that's even worse, even better. And soon, they're bearing their souls to one another about the horrific violence they had experienced as children. One man saw his father pour gasoline on his mother and set her on fire. And that 
they realized was something they all had in common, was the experience of violence when they were still very young. And they had internalized that rage, that helplessness, and they acted it out when they were um, committing a robbery. To heal the offender required healing the trauma that they had internalized. I've told you before about Bruno Olslegel, uh, who was a good example of how you should choose, take better care in choosing your parents, uh, because his were alcoholics. Their parents were probably alcoholics. And they taught Bruno that he was no good. Uh, he was a bum. He didn't do anything right. He should be ashamed. And won't you get me another beer? And he was well on his way into following his parents' footsteps. That's the way of addictions. After years of living with someone who is an addict, your family may not know of any other way to deal with you other than getting you the beer, uh, enabling you to participate in the addiction process. And we've learned in order to bring healing, we have to treat the whole family to look at grace and to remove the shame. If you moved into Chicago and you're, you got a really good job, you know, these $200,000 a year jobs for a 25-year-old, surely that's, that's where you're going, uh, and you get a loft apartment, one of the things that you'd better do is hire a building inspector to tell you what had been stored in that loft when it was a warehouse because they've discovered a lot of them that used to store chemicals, really nasty chemicals, and the people who live in them get cancer. Now, Chicago's unique because usually those neighborhoods are in very poor neighborhoods. They're in rural areas because you store the dirty stuff in cheap land. And who lives on cheap land but people who are poor? It's called environmental racism in the South because so many African Americans were in communities with atrocious cancer rates because of the stuff that had, the poisons that had been stored there. You can have bad health just by where you live. Michael Kimmel is a Princeton sociologist who has studied uh, men who were neo-Nazis, uh, people who had joined the Klan, people who had joined the offshoots of the radical right organizations. And he was asking himself, you know, World War II is over. We know how that movie ends. Why on earth would anyone join groups like that now? And he discovered that it's pretty much the same reason why people join religious cults. Uh, the doctrine, the beliefs, the poison, that's the second act. The first act is you're wounded, you're desperate, you're lonely, you're ashamed of yourself, and here's a group that accepts you. Here's a group that isn't going to beat on you. And they have lots of parties. <laughs> they have lots of parties. And then you learn the hate and you learn the rage. The irony is that ISIS, the, the radical Islamic movements, they recruit the same way. And when you work back in time as to how did you get involved in this, you get back to pain that was birthed in this person's life when they were still a young man. And Kimmel says, young men who couldn't do what society expected of them, have a job that was good enough so that you could support a family. You couldn't be a grown-up. And so you joined the group, and you found other ways to express your anger and your rage. And you didn't even notice till much later that you had gone over to the dark side. And then there are ways that we engage in activities that lead to poor health because, well, we eat too much because we don't get the love that we need. We know that we need exercise, but it's hard, and gyms are expensive, and there is so much to do, and it's really much easier to do something else. And, 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 and there is pain in our lives. I mean, real pain. 
I mean, it hurts in the back to get up. You can't do anything. And the doctor tells you, well, you don't need to live with that pain. Here, take this prescription. But then the prescription runs out and the pain hasn't gone away. And what do you do? Well, you try to get the pills another way. And then someone tells you, you know, heroin's much cheaper. And it is. Stephen Kovalovich, when he came and he spoke to us, he had been a paramedic. Uh, he had a good job. They get paid a lot of money. And he found himself rescued from his heroin addiction, not once, not twice, four times before he finally went through recovery and it stuck so far. He said, I didn't set out in life to be a heroin addict. It just sort of grew on him. And then there are the ways, well, health is complicated. Health is sometimes out of our control. Health is sometimes determined by forces outside of our control. Health is about what we do with our lives. Health is about ourselves as individuals, but it's also about our parents, it's about our friends, it's about our economy and our place in society. It's complex. And in general, it has our complete attention. If you're over 50, you've probably started to notice how people your age are dying every day from natural causes. And while you're sure this will never happen to you, I mean, we're going to live forever, right? Uh, you do notice that maybe it's time to start getting things in gear. And if you're over 70, you might believe that there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to die when you die. And so, why bother? And if you're younger than 50, you probably are living in a bit of a fool's paradise because this is never going to happen to you, even though the habits and the practices and the diets and all the things you do that are going to create the diseases that are going to kill you, you've started them now. And it's really hard to get out of that rut when it's time. On one level, Sacred scriptures of both Christianity and Judaism don't say a lot about how to be healthy. They were written, after all, at a time when understandings of health were very different than they are today. If you were sick, you must have sinned, or your parents sinned, or maybe you were possessed by a demon, or maybe it was your lot in life, because people die, and in those days, people died a lot. Who knew? But at a deeper level, scriptures have a lot to teach us about being healthy and what leads to health. Our health is largely a function of the broader realities of our lives. It's a consequence, not a primary causal agent, of larger forces. The Hebrew scriptures therefore focus upon our lives primarily as first being in covenant with God. We are in relationship with God, and that's what the Old Testament is about, a God who is trustworthy, who calls people to better lives, to be better people. Jesus extends this notion of being in covenant with God by his call to us to take up his yoke and follow him in his ways of loving our neighbors, which leads to communities of justice of accepting the grace and love of God which leads us to forgiveness and setting aside the loads of the past that weigh down our present lives, accepting God as Lord of our lives and not the other competitors, our pain, our shame, our hatred, our drugs, our hopelessness. They are not God. God is God. A relationship with God gives us a firm foundation a ground of hope and purpose that is larger than our own neediness and so gives us a foundation for our lives. Secondly, our lives are made in the image of God. We are not God, but neither are we shameful or helpless or hopeless or powerless. Out of the dust we are made, the astronomers tell us that our bodies are made of the same dust that you find in stars and planets. Out of that cosmic dust, life was created. 
The book of Genesis gives us two stories about creation. The first that we read today, telling us about how we are given dominion, that we are made in God's image, that we have control over creation and our own lives. And thus, we have some power. We have some responsibility about how we live our lives. And it goes on to tell us that all of creation was not only good, it was very good, very good. So even when things go their worst, there's no need to feel shame. There's no need to feel helpless because God does not make junk. And you, are, me, are loved by God. And finally, God gives us hope. We have hope because we enjoy God's presence in our lives and because we know that no matter how deep a pit we get ourselves into in this life, that is not the end of us. God gets us out of pits, calls us to new life. This happens in a day, in a series of days, one day at a time, living a new way, changing direction and where we go. So the violent offenders that Bob Roberts worked with realized in that moment of aha in their introductions what their issue was. And they had to do a lot of work at getting healed from the trauma that had steered their lives since they were wee small things. And they committed crimes again 40% less than the control groups. Bruno Oslegel's aunt decided it was time for him to go to church and Sunday school. And in church, he met adults who didn't yell at him, who didn't curse him out, and who didn't hit him. And as he grew up, he realized that there was normal in life and there was abnormal, and it was his parents that were abnormal. There was a better way, and he could choose. The realization of the deep pain in the lives of the neo-Nazis that Michael Kimmel studied opened them to a broader expression of reality than what they believed existed. The rage that they lived by would, would if they followed it, ultimately consume them. But they could leave that world, leave the hate behind, and live new life. Our lives on this earth will come to an end. Our mortal frames will perish. But until that time, God calls us, God blesses us with abundant life. There is no need for shame or guilt. Neither is there a magic pill that will make our pains go away. But there is a strength and courage for us to live our lives, to do what is necessary, to live life abundantly. To that, God calls us. Amen. Thank you.
Let us pray together. We thank you, God, for the blessings of your love. You give us reason for hope, patience, and joy. You give us opportunities and challenges for our lives. You give us your abiding presence. For these gifts, we thank you and offer our gifts in return, that they may be used to extend your love to others. Amen. Let us go forth with love. Let us go forth with justice. Let us go forth with the presence of Christ in our lives, that we may serve God with joy and thanksgiving. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>